The program will now begin. Hello, and welcome to this virtual event, Realizing Women, Peace, and Security in Ukraine, Voices from Women on the Front Lines. I'm Alain Brevere, and I direct Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. Russia's unprovoked assault on Ukraine continues to bring devastation and destruction. Millions of Ukrainians are internally displaced or forced to flee their country as refugees. Tens of thousands have been killed. The targeting of homes, schools, train stations, hospitals are occurring in defiance of humanitarian law. War crimes abound. The utter brutality is pervasive. The war is taking a terrible toll on women and children who comprise 90% of those forced to leave their homes. There is mounting evidence of women being sexually abused. And there are reports of thousands of women and children being trafficked across the border. Civil society organizations, many led by women, face a desperate need for funds, supplies, and freedom of movement for the people they serve. At the same time, Ukrainian women are playing leading roles on the front lines of the war. They are fighting in the armed forces in significant numbers. Others are volunteering in defense of their country. They are spearheading relief air efforts, monitoring human rights violations, working as journalists, and so much more. The war in Ukraine is a concrete reminder of the relevance of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security, which calls for the protection of women as well as their meaningful inclusion in all areas of decision-making from the security sector to peace negotiations. We will shortly hear from women leaders in Ukraine who are working around the clock in myriad vital ways to respond to the assault in their country. We have close to 800 attendees joining us from around the globe on our Zoom platform and more on Facebook Live. We have already received many pre-submitted questions, but you can still send in questions throughout the discussion as well by using the Q&A feature on your screen. Just before the February invasion of Ukraine, we heard from four brave women in Kharkiv, Mariupol, Kramatorsk, and Zaporizhia. They have been resolute in supporting their free, independent, and democratic Ukraine. Today, their cities have been relentlessly bombarded. We wanted to check in with them, so let us hear from them now and see how things are on the ground for them. Тихого вам дня. Сьогодні так ми вітаємось в Україні, бо тиша це означає, що не треба ховатися від російських ракет. Я Ганна Сейтерли, правозахисниця, українка. Я народилась та вирісла в Луганській області. Я вимушена була покинути свій дім у 2014 році у пошуках свободи та безпеки. Сьогодні моєму старшому сину 12 років. Він друге у своєму житті тікає від війни у пошуках безпеки. Безпеку ми шукаємо й досі. Навіть зараз, перебуваючи в одній з європейських країн, я все ще не відчуваю себе в безпеці. Останні чотири роки я працюю над локалізацією національного плану дій 1325 в Запорізькій області. 23 лютого на форумі з локалізації національного плану дій я говорила про формальний підхід у роботі владних структур, які не дав нам можливості розробити місцевий план таким чином, який ми б реагувати на виклики безпеці, і відображати потреби конкретних людей. Сьогодні, як і багато років поспіль, нашою головною ціллю є безпека. Доступ до їжі, води, ліків, доступ до медичної допомоги, можливість сховатися у бомбосховищі, доступ до інформації, можливість заробити гроші, екологічна безпека, політична безпека, емоційна безпека, відсутність насильства і геноциду проти українського народу. Безпека в умовах війни і в період відновлення матиме різний характер, і про це потрібно думати вже зараз. Мир 
та безпека в Україні дорівнює миру та безпеки у всьому світі. Ми маємо об'єднати зусилля і разом працювати над створенням безпечного життя для українців та українок, для жителів усієї планети. Саме зараз планувати механізми відновлення міст та людей після нашої перемоги. Слава Україні! Доброго вечора! Ми з України, а саме з Харкова. Я Ярина Чеговець, голова благодійної організації «Сестра Милосердя» та голова всеукраїнського об'єднання учасників бойових дій та волонтерів АТО у Харківській області. Ми – жінки, жінки, які зараз борються з ордою, котра напала на нас вже повномасштабному наступі 24 лютого 2022 року. Саме зараз відбувається ця кривава геноцидна війна до українського народу, до українських жінок особливо. Ми з нашими дівчатами і з нашими жінками лишаємося тут, в Харкові, в місті, в якому я прожила 40 років, а зараз його практично нема, бо все розбомблено і все розгецено. Але ми лишаємося тут і ми боремося з цією проклятою ордою. І саме зараз Україна стала найпотужнішою державою в світі, бо вона дає відсіч і дає відсіч також завдяки вам. Ми дуже дякуємо вам за ту зброю, яку ви постачаєте нашій країні і розумієте, те, що ми боремося за весь Всесвіт, а не тільки за нашу країну. Дякуємо вам за це, але все одно звертаємося до вас. У нас дуже сильно змінилося життя, і ми дуже сильно просимо вас, будь ласка, допоможіть ще закрити небо. Ми хочемо, щоб на нашим нащадкам щось лишилося ціле, хоча б деякі міста України. Дякуємо і слава Україні! Україна обов'язково переможе! Мене звуть Лілія Кісліцина, я з міста Краматорськ, координаторка коаліції 1325 «Донеччина жінки мирбезпека» у Донецькій області. Коаліція ця об'єднує 45 громадських організацій. В моєму житті 24 лютого 2022 року змінилося все. Або повторилося, скоріше так правильно буду сказати. Як і у 2014 році, я знову у статусі переселенки, я знову без свого дому, без своєї роботи, без свого улюбленого міста. Сьогодні в Україні проходять дуже страшні події. Від цієї жорстокості, від цих вбивств, які ми сьогодні бачимо, просто ніні серце. Але сьогодні жінки України, чоловіки, діти і всі люди знаходяться в дуже активній фазі протистояння. Вчора я збирала коаліцію 1325 Донеччина і 45 організацій прийняли участь 19. І всі вони активно волонтерять, всі вони активно працюють і всі вони активно борються за права жінок і права всіх людей. І я хочу звернутися до всіх, до всього світу. Нам треба зробити правильні висновки із цих подій. Нам треба зробити все, щоб Україна перемогла. Тому що, коли переможе Україна, переможе весь світ. Переможе все світле і цивілізоване, що є на цій землі. Нашим людям сьогодні достатньо відваги і достатньо патріотизму, щоб боротися до кінця. І тому я прошу, давайте нам зброю, давайте нам допомогу, виходьте на вулиці в знак солідарності з Україною. І потім разом ми побудуємо щасливу, прогресивну, а головне – мирну і щасливу цивілізацію. Доброго дня. Мене звуть Марина Погачова. Я голова громадської організації «Маріупольська асоціація жінок перегій». Я з Маріуполя. Чи змінилося моє життя та життя багатьох жінок з початком відкритої військової агресії Росії? А звичайно, змінилося. Моє місто перетворилося в місто Примару. Але ми, жінки Маріуполя, жінки Маріупольської асоціації «Жінок-берегиня» не склали руки. 
я завжди казала і кажу, жінка має право, право вирішувати за себе. Ми залишалися в місті, навіть коли відправили свій перший евакуаційний автобус 26 лютого. Виїхали з міста лише 17-го, бо вже не можна було залишатися з новим евакуаційним рейсом. Це приклад того, що жінка може робити доволі серйозні речі, навіть в такій ситуації. Але, звичайно, нам треба підтримка. Підтримка світу. Дякую. I want to thank the Ukrainian Women's Fund for helping us to get in touch with these very brave women. Let us turn now to Ukraine's ambassador to the United States, the Honorable Oksana Margarova, the first woman to hold this position for her country. She has been working tirelessly to advocate for Ukraine and its needs in this time of extreme crisis. She knows the urgency of this moment for her country and for all of those who support freedom and democracy. She previously served as Ukraine's Minister of Finance. Madam Ambassador, thank you for being with us this morning uh, and thank you for taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedule uh, to be here to help us set the context for this discussion. If you could please touch on the role of women on the front lines in Ukraine and why it's important for the international community to stand with them uh, in this hour of need for them and their fellow citizens. Thank you very much, dear Milan, dear Ambassador Vervir. Uh, it's nice to see Secretary Schmidt and other women leaders and conference participants here with us. And it was especially uh, great to start the event with our four sisters who have inspired us before when we were all preparing for this uh, horrible war. And they have been very strong on getting ready and we see why. We see how they continue to defend uh, Ukraine in different places, but nevertheless tirelessly, like so many women. Uh, let me thank the Georgetown Institute for Peace, Women, Peace and Security for organizing this event. I think it's very important for all of us to get together and uh, through virtual conferences, through meetings when possible, uh, to join forces, not only to discuss, but also to act on something that our brave, you know, brave nation goes during the past 72 days, but also during the past eight years. Something that, that the war that we're experiencing, uh, of, of, okay, of course, this full-fledged phase in the 75 days finally got attention of everyone. But this war has been in Ukraine for eight years. And just yesterday, the whole world celebrated and uh, mourned over losses, but celebrated the 77th anniversary of the Allied forces victory over Nazis. And that historic victory uh, over Nazi tyrants was also possible not only to the millions of brave men, but also millions of women who sought, you know, who had no thoughts of quitting the, the fight then and we see the same fight from, from women right now. Ukrainian women demonstrated enormous strength and resilience during that terrible war. And again, you know, our nation lost about 10 million during the World War II, out of which 7 million were civilians. We know how is it. We remember it from our grandmothers and our grandfather's stories. The post-war reconstruction after that, which was also very difficult, was single-handedly done by, by women because after the war, they took uh, a lead in so many areas, which before the World War II were considered men's type of jobs. But in Ukraine, as everywhere in Europe, after the devastation of Nazis, women did that. Women did uh, a, a number of efforts. Right now, Ukrainian women go and children go through unimaginable cruelty. You all know the figures, about 6 million people had to leave the country and are in Europe or in other places right now. About 8 million are displaced internally in Ukraine. They had to flee their houses. Sometimes they've lost everything. They had to flee just with children and uh, you know some documents if they were lucky to grab them. 
and sometimes they had to flee while losing some of their children, while try getting to safety only half of their children, some of their children, taking to safety other women's children because they lost their children. Just imagine 14 million women in Ukraine are displaced, either internally or outside, 14 million uh, citizens. Uh, also, in addition to that, about 10 million Ukrainians, men and women, live in the areas which are constantly shelled, which do not have water, do not have gas, uh, do not have access to the basic, uh, basic human uh, needs. Thousands of destroyed schools, thousands of destroyed homes, hospitals. Uh, not to say that we still uh, have to do a lot to win, but it will take years also and much efforts to rebuild. Yet despite the pain and the hardship and all the human losses, Ukrainian women remain strong. And we just saw four examples of many who remain strong. Uh, we discuss many first ladies, previous first ladies, great first ladies quotes before. And I always like this quote that Eleanor Roosevelt used to say that a woman is like a tea bag. You cannot tell how strong she is until you put her in the hot water. I think Ukrainian women has shown regardless of how hot, hot the water is, we are very strong and very resilient. In the last 75 days, Ukrainian women once again has shown examples of that. They remain in place, they organize initiatives, they build morale, they raise funds, they cook in hospitals or just on the streets to help others. They provide medical assistance, they teach children at either refugee camps on the, in the areas where people return to like Bucha and Borodyanka. Women actually today have about 15% of the armed forces of Ukraine. Quite high number if you compare even to some European countries. Some like the musician Olga Rukavishnikova decided to quit to put aside the instrument and join the armed forces or the territorial defense. Others do what they do best, teach, uh, cook, communicate, even singing. You know, the, the famous Ukrainian soprano, everyone talks about here in the U.S., the Lyudmila Monasterska, who replaced in the metropolitan area the propagandist Nitrepko, now is a, a very uh, large symbol of Ukraine. And at every performance that she has, she comes with a Ukrainian flag and sends very important message here in the U.S. Several days ago, you all saw the video that went viral, not only in Ukraine, but here also. A brave Ukrainian woman, our Ptashka, who was singing in Azov style, together with her brothers in arms. She not only boosts morale of, of her brothers there in Azov style under unimaginable uh, pressure and bombing and destruction from Russians, but she also sends a very important message to all of us outside that we have to do everything possible, but also everything impossible to save everyone in Ukraine, to save everyone in Azov steel and Mariupol plant, we, to, to, to save everyone in Kharkiv, to save everyone everywhere. Because you know the, the damage that this new Nazis, the Russians are doing now to Ukraine is unbelievable. So I'm also happy that today, Milan, you have invited so many uh, civil society groups and they're joining forces because we all work as one team now, the government, diplomats, armed forces, uh, and the civil society to not only share the experiences, but also join forces to, to work together everywhere in Ukraine, but outside. And in times of this, it's very important, again, the women's solidarity, something that we discussed before, the, before uh, this phase of the war, something that we discussed even before the war started in 2014. How, is, how important it is for women to help women, for women to support women. In situations like this, we see it even more. And yesterday on Mother's Day, we saw another remarkable uh, scene of this women's solidari the solidarity when the First Lady Jill Biden and First Lady Olena Zelenska met in Ushgorod. And it meant so much for both women here, but women in Ukraine, that these two women has shown remarkable courage, remarkable courage for our First Lady to get out to Ushgorod in, in times when, you know, Russians are doing everything possible to attack anyone and especially the symbol of our resistance, our president and our first lady. But she thought it was very important to be there, to be there and uh, talk on behalf of all Ukrainian mothers and all Ukrainian women. 
and also the courage of First Lady Jill Biden, who traveled to Europe, but decided that it's very important to cross the border into, into Ukraine and meet with our First Lady and talk to women, not only in the displaced areas outside of Ukraine, but also in Ukraine. And this is the support that we need, and this is the support that we feel from the American people. And as many of, of the brave women before me today said, we need more. We need to do everything possible and impossible to, to win this war and win it as soon as possible. So let me close by thanking to you, Milan, uh, a great friend of Ukraine, American, but also Ukrainian and someone who inspired so many women here in the United States, but definitely uh, millions of women in Ukraine, even before they uh, knew about a great work you are doing for Ukraine. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's an inspiration to see a woman at, at this position and working tirelessly, spending all your free time on advancing the, uh, the agenda and fight of women for equality for the right to be who we want to be. And now during this war times, for the right to be also safe and to, to, to do what we, what we can do both best, you know, to, to, to put our talents, not into fighting the war, but actually building something, creating something. So let me thank you for this event, but also for everything you've done before and everything I'm sure you will do. And I think it's very important for all of us to stay, uh, close together and fight this fight together so that we can win and we can win and we will win. So with that, I would like to say uh, Slava Ukraini and uh, God bless America. And we need to join forces even more in order to stop this evil. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Ambassador. Thank you for your example, for your own courage uh, and for reminding us <clears throat> that we need to do the possible and the impossible. Uh, we will turn now to Secretary General of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, Helga Schmidt. The OSCE is the largest regional security organization in the world and comprises 57 member states, including Russia and Ukraine. The Secretary General has been working tirelessly to, an, to advance an effective regional response to the war in Ukraine. In 2014, following Russia's annexation of Crimea and the war in Eastern Ukraine, the OSCE played an important monitoring mission to reduce violence along the line of separation between Ukraine and its territories occupied by the Russian-backed separatists. The OSCE also acted as a mediator and trilateral contact group in the Minsk negotiations to try to resolve the war. Although, although the war didn't end, there were successful efforts to reduce hostilities and to address critical humanitarian needs. The Secretary General is an accomplished German diplomat and has held a number of significant positions in her government's foreign ministry as well as in the EU. Secretary General, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the OSCE continues to play a bit very critical role. The organization has a very comprehensive view of security across three dimensions and has been committed to the role of 1325 and the role of women that it represents. Uh, and we look forward uh, to your remarks, uh, particularly about what regional organizations and others can do to be supportive uh, at this moment. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Melan, for inviting uh, me today. I was listening with a lot of emotion to the very moving but very powerful uh, testimonies of uh, for Ukrainian women, of course, also to you, Ambassador. Uh, Marka Rova, and um, uh, I'm grateful that I can contribute to this uh, to this conversation today because indeed also within this organization we are trying to see what uh, how best to support the women and and girls, but also to um, uh, highlight the essential role women play. And I would very much agree with Ambassador Makarov. You said it. Even if you look back in history, the history books tend to forget the significant role played by women. Um, 
Uh, Melania mentioned it already, the role the OEC has played um, actually for more than 25 years to strengthen comprehensive security in and around Ukraine. And for us, comprehensive security is very much also human security, and it is also women, peace and security. Um, you mentioned our special monitoring mission, and let me say it breaks my heart because we are now in the, uh, in the process of closing down that mission because the Russian Federation could not join consensus on extending the mission's mandate. The, and this, this mission, and I think, uh, really made a remarkable difference because it was not only, and this is what many people know, it was not only reporting in an objective manner, impartially on the uh, ceasefire violations, but it also brokered the localized, the so-called localized ceasefires, which really allowed the necessary repair work to repair damaged infrastructure on, and this is what I told the Russian Federation, on both sides of the contact line, and that benefited millions, millions of people, uh, including, of course, women and, and, and girls. Um, so we have to close now, but let me also say the OEC is still in Ukraine, our project coordinator, who has a broad mandate, who is now particularly focusing on humanitarian support uh, to Ukraine, he has relocated to Ushkorod um, uh, at, at this point, but he's also going, of course, uh, back and forth to, uh, to Kiev. We also have uh, the other OEC institutions uh, uh, continuing to support um, uh, Ukraine. Now, uh, it was said before, this war is having taken a terrible toll, particularly on, on the women and, and children, uh, devastating consequences on the civilian population as a whole, with so many millions of people who have fled the country. And, um, and But as always, it, any conflict, any war has a disproportionate impact on, on women and girls, because women and girls who are refugees or also internally displaced are at higher risk of being exposed to sexual violence and are at particular risk of falling prey to criminal gangs involved in trafficking and sexual exploitation. What we're seeing already now, that trafficking rates are increasing. So are the reports of sexual violence against women and girls uh, by, by Russian soldiers. So restricted access to employment, education, decision-making spaces, and healthcare, including sexual and, and reproductive health services, has further exacerbating the existing gender inequalities. Now, certain groups of women and girls are particularly vulnerable, and this includes those who are poor, the elderly, disabled, pregnant, all those who face difficulties fleeing uh, to safety, as well as, of course, accessing basic services. Women and girls have specific humanitarian needs, um, and, um, um, and these needs uh, and vulnerabilities must be addressed urgently in order to mitigate the risks to women and girls and to ensure that the whole of society is being supported. And that's why uh, uh, the OEC is working to respond to such needs. So just to give you a few examples, we provide practical gender sensitive recommendations uh, to uh, OEC participating states to strengthen their ability to prevent trafficking. This is one of the, the, the key issues. And this includes recommendations specific to the digital space because there is, of course, a massive problem of online exploitation. We are also working with partners on the ground to uh, provide practical guidance for service providers to survivors of gender-based violence. But of course, it's not only about mitigating risks and supporting um, uh, survivors, and uh, women are victims, but women also have a, a very powerful uh, role to play as leaders they foster resilience. So they work to respond to the needs of their communities. Despite bearing the brunt of the conflict, women peace builders and uh, women uh, human rights defenders are at the front line. And we are seeing that also in Ukraine. They provide life-saving assistance to millions in need. Many women peace builders and uh, women human rights defenders are documenting war crimes. They're advocating for women's needs and they're working to build a sustainable future. Their expertise and their leadership, including in conflict resolution is absolutely critical to building peace and leveraging opportunities for peace. And this is why 
we put the woman peace and security agenda at the heart of our efforts. The OC works to ensure that women continue to have access and support, by the way, also by providing safe spaces and platforms for women civil society actors to connect and to, to strategize. Within the coming weeks, I will convene a special meeting of our networking platform for women leaders, including peace builders and mediators. This is a platform uh, I launched uh, last December. And that meeting will focus particularly on the women of Ukraine with a view to inform the future work of the OEC with them, but also with their communities. And today I will also launch a call for applications to the OEC's Women's Peace uh, um, Leadership Program. This is a flagship activity of the networking platform for women leaders. Ukrainian women will be participating in this program. And the idea is to strengthen their ability to meaningfully engage and influence the peace processes at all levels, including by providing networking opportunities and platforms for the participants to engage and connect with decision makers and other influential actors that are involved in the relevant processes. This may be not for now, but hopefully uh, for, the, for the very near future, because as we all have been saying, this war needs to stop. In these challenging times, I think we need to ensure that women are heard and their needs are met, their dignity is respected and their work is being uh, recognized. And I was participating last week in Warsaw at the conference co-hosted by Poland and, uh, and, and Sweden. It was a pledging conference. It brought together 6.5 billion, but I also used this opportunity to underline the specific needs uh, women have, the specific challenges they face including also in the context of violence and, and, and uh, trafficking. I will stop here, not to be too long, but thanks for this opportunity to join you today. Thanks for all the work you do. Um, and just uh, let me uh, ensure you that we hear from Werner, but also uh, our project coordinator in Ukraine, but also our missions will continue uh, to uh, do everything to fight and, uh, for a more stable and more secure and a more peace, peaceful future for Ukraine. Thank you. Well, thank you, Secretary General. Uh, thank you for the call to action, uh, but also reiterating the strong commitment of the OSCE uh, to uh, ending this war and also to supporting uh, the women who are on the front lines. Thank you so much uh, for all that you do. We're going to turn now to our uh, panel. Uh, first to Yevhenia Kravchuk, who is a member of Ukraine's parliament, the Verhova Rada. She is the deputy head of the Servant of the People Party. She is a leader on women, peace and security issues and a longtime advocate for women's full and meaningful participation in politics. She's a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe's Committee for Equality and Non-Discrimination. Yevhenia, thank you so much for taking the time out of your own activities today to be with us. I wonder how you see um, the framework of 1325, uh, which you have worked on as it now relates to the war in the security sector, in the peace process, in addressing sexual violence and more. Ukraine has a very strong national action plan on women, peace and security that was revised uh, not too long ago. Uh, and it has made significant strides uh, in, uh, in implementation uh, across the government. So can you tell us how 1325 is being um, applied to the war uh, and perhaps provide recommendations for the international community uh, at this critical time? And welcome to you. Thank you, Melin. Uh, first of all, you know, I would like to start with showing uh, one, you know, piece for my security, basically, it's a tourniquet. It's, uh, I have to carry it in my purse every day, um, just in case when I go out outside, uh, because you never know when the Russian missile um, will hit, uh, you know, any city uh, in Ukraine, uh, because you can't be really sure, you know, or feel safe in any corner um, of Ukraine right now. Um, 
And um, it happened so that I'm also uh, an author of reports and resolution uh, of Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe, uh, which actually deals with matters of uh, uh, women in conflict and peace reconciliation. Um, and uh, it will be on vote in PACE in June. Um, and I returned from my fact finding mission from Hague just a night before the full scale invasion started. I had an opportunity um, to, to discuss uh, about uh, women and, and um, uh, sexual violence during conflicts in ICC, in International Criminal Court. Um, I had meetings in residual tribunal for former Yugoslavia. I had actual meetings with um, our colleagues, NGOs and uh, government representatives from the Netherlands, which are really good in national action plan. Um, and now we are all um, living, um, living it, you know, in our our lives uh, every day. Not just speaking about uh, security, um, uh, speaking how to uh, women could participate, but you know, we're living it um, everyday life. And in my um, in, in my resolution, I try to look um, at, at women not as uh, as the vulnerable group. Of course, uh, women are vulnerable during conflicts, but also um, they are uh, leaders. They are these NGOs that uh, are on the ground. And we saw these uh, powerful voices and, and, and faces and, and women whose spirits are, are strong, uh, even in these, uh, you know, during these uh, atrocities. Um, they are um, they are warriors. 15% uh, uh, of women are part. Uh, I mean, in, in Ukrainian army, 15% are women. Um, they are doctors. They are healing people right now here, here uh, on, up in the front and uh, in in other uh, regions. Um, they are um, also political leaders. Uh, for example, in Ukraine. Uh, the Vice Prime Minister for um, Reintegration, Irina Voroshuk, is uh, actually the main negoci negotiator right now for all the exchanges of prisoners. She works every day uh, for some men or women to return home. And we saw this, um, this video and, and these pictures uh, when uh, civilians from, from Mariupol returned. Um, and um, they were greeted in, in Zaporizhia at not occupied territory. Um, also, uh, we formed uh, even a women diplomatic battalion, so to say, and Melon, you saw, met with us uh, when we were just a month ago in Washington, DC. Our women parliamentarians went to different countries, uh, met with political leaders, met with our counterparts. And we talked about how to help uh, Ukraine, how to help Ukrainian women and Ukrainians, as, you know, as total. I remember, um, you know, that um, I was speaking about weapons and the types of weapons more than I spoke, you know, my previous whole life. My, my old notepad uh, was signed with different types of weapons we should get to stop this war and to stop these atrocities. Because, um, you know, I, I never um, uh, stopped telling that the best humanitarian aid right now for Ukraine is weapons to, to kick Russians out and to stop this war. Uh, but uh, to come closer to the uh, national um, action plan and about the, um, you know, things that we need to change and things that we need to uh, really focus on. Um, um, of course, the uh, conflict-based uh, sexual violence is uh, the thing, the issue that have to be addressed. Um, we can't really say the number of uh, of this uh, rape, uh, you know, group uh, rapes and, and rapes of girls and, and uh, mothers in front of their child, uh, because uh, women are still afraid to talk about it. We have 24 mobile uh, teams that give uh, psychological help, uh, but still, of course, we understand it's not enough. and. Uh, um, I'm really thankful for the um, United uh, Nations uh, Special Representative um, on um, um, 
of, for the prevention of sexual violence in conflict, Pramila Patin, that visited Kiev just days um, days ago, and um, our Vice Prime Minister for European Integration, Olga Stefanishin, another uh, women political leader um, in Ukraine, uh, signed a memorandum, um, and we really hope that United Nations will help us uh, further to, uh, first of all, to secure uh, the uh, psychological help and uh, needed uh, trauma counseling for Ukrainian women. And we need to understand not only in Ukraine, but also for those who uh, went to, to other countries uh, who had to leave uh, the, the Ukraine uh, because of war. <coughs> and um, we really hope that these women could get trauma counseling as well in their mother tongue, no, no matter what country uh, they are right now. Uh, our um, action plan, uh, the new one uh, that, that was adopted in 2020, and now we of course um, uh, see that uh, we need to, um, to, to, to give some changes, to put some changes into it. And a government is so working already, and um, I'm really, um, I, I see the um, NGOs and I see representatives of those NGOs who are also working closely with uh, Ukrainian government. And we really hope uh, that in July, we could uh, present changes into the national action plan. Uh, but also what's very important, uh, we have to understand that there will be no long lasting peace if there will be no justice. Uh, because uh, we need to make sure that uh, those perpetrators of human rights uh, will be punished. And uh, that's why it's very important uh, to talk, not only to talk, but to create international tribunal uh, for these war crimes that were committed um, in Ukraine. Uh, by the, um, 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 by the numbers that uh, were set by our uh, attorney uh, general, uh, another woman, um, Irina Benediktova, we already have 9,000 of cases, uh, not only concerning, of course, the sexual violence, but totally. And all of these cases, not, um, they can't just stay on paper. Uh, they need to be in international tribunal. And these women need to see that their uh, perpetrators are punished um, and the, 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 they will get the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 I don't know how many years in prison, but a lot. Um, and of course, some uh, um, um, uh, not reparation, but um, compensations to the victims also uh, should be paid. Um, so once again, thank you for, uh, for organizing this event. Um, um, another thing to, just to, to end with, I really would like to ask you know, all the representatives of international uh, organizations, uh, please support NGOs that work on the ground. Uh, because what we saw from the very beginning of the full-scale invasion, uh, that those NGOs, even small ones who work on the ground, they do a lot. They deliver humanitarian aid, you know, um, from hands to hands. Uh, and at the very same time, big organizations uh, were reluctant. They were not working um, on the ground. Now we see that the Red Cross is helping with evacuation, but um, at the very beginning, we, we didn't see them on the ground. So it's very important to support uh, NGOs, uh, especially those NGOs that help women and are headed by, uh, are chaired by women, uh, because you know they have this network that uh, they can use um, um, during the war. And to uh, the, the last thing to say, uh, we actually need to be, um, very clear that after this war, we believe that Ukraine will win, but we need to sit all together and look at the new security architecture that need to be built. Because, um, you know, we talked about OCE, we talked about the United Nations, OCE about, about cooperation and security. There is no cooperation and no security in Europe right now. We have to be clear about that. We need to uh, look this into the eyes and need to uh, build a new architecture, a new security architecture in which every woman will be sure uh, that uh, 
her rights uh, will not be violated. Thank you so much. Moanne, you're muted. Thank you, uh, Yevhenia, for that very comprehensive um, presentation on various aspects of women's participation. Uh, I have also heard from the from S RSG Patton, who had very constructive meetings, uh, and I'm pleased that you and others were able uh, to meet with her. Uh, and to the points that you raised about uh, ultimately ensuring prosecution uh, for these war crimes, including um, the sexual violence uh, that has been going on. Could I just ask you um, one question before we move on, which is what are the possibilities of women's participation in the peace processes, either current talks or the talks that will be coming uh, in the future? Um, as you see, all the peace talks are stopped. Now the weapons talking, and um, I think that uh, only after the victory on the battlefield, the real peace talks uh, will begin. Um, uh, but I would really underline the role of uh, the uh, talks and, and negotiations that Vice Prime Minister Irina Varshub does, because even when these uh, so-called peace talks are stopped, she's working every day uh, to, uh, to, 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 to get peoples out, and that's very important because that's the result that we can see um, every day with uh, either green corridor or with in, in exchange. But we really, uh, we do understand that uh, uh, the, um, um, the more women, are, the, the, the more input of women we see in these peace talks, the long lasting will be uh, peace. We do understand that. Uh, well, thank you for that. And we'll come back to you when we have the Q&A portion of our program. Uh, we're going to turn now uh, to Olga uh, Ivasovska, who chairs the board of APORA, a leading advocacy, advocacy and public oversight organization uh, that supports civil society across Ukraine to ensure democratic, transparent, and inclusive government. Olha is an expert on electoral legislation and political processes. And from 2016 to 18, she actually participated in the political subgroup of the Trilateral Contact Group in Minsk, um, which it goes to the heart of what uh, Yevhenia and uh, we have just been talking about. Uh, she has been uh, widely published on electoral legislation advancing democracy and is viewed as one of the top experts in this field. Uh, so Olga, thank you so much uh, for being with us um, at this time. Uh, you are a representative of the very robust uh, civil society in Ukraine. Uh, perhaps you can give us a sense of how um, it is manifesting itself uh, at this critical time. Uh, what is APORA doing to ensure that civil society and women's organizations have a voice in all of the critical decision-making processes? And from your own experience in the Minsk talks, why is that kind of inclusion so important? Uh, and what can the international community be doing now to support APORA's efforts and efforts of other uh, NGOs across civil society in Ukraine? Hello to everyone. And you highlighted very important questions as for me because women participating, uh, it's about everything, not only about peacekeeping or peace building process, it's about political participation. Uh, my organization, Civil Network of Opora, advocated electoral reform and good practices in Ukraine more than 10 years. We had significant progress, such a new electoral system with open list. Uh, became a reality. A strict danger, uh, gender quota uh, held in law. IDPs within the country gain suffrage at all levels. People with disabilities were to have a fully acceptable and accessible polling station by 2025. Uh, and so what now? Uh, authoritarian Russia became the war 
against a uh, democratic country. And this is a huge challenge for now to show that democratic country is not so weak against authoritarian regime. That's why I believe that democratic world has to support Ukraine as much as it possible. I uh, truly highlighted what uh, Eugenia said, that weapons now it's humanitarian aid and it's uh, the best tool for this stage of aggression to support Ukraine. But we have to think about future already. In the electoral vote of Ukraine in 2020, the gender quota was set at 40% and may mandatory for political parties. But the gender quota became the strongest during the war. In some professional um, or some professions or diplomacy, women's mobility is more significant today. Their professional participation through the tools of horizontal diplomacy can be both a significant challenge as, and the huge opportunity. But we all need to remember that women often are also mothers. Women must be professionally active and remain responsibility, responsible mothers. Sometimes we have to choose whether to go to essential international negotiation work or to stay with a child. International partners can be more flexible in war conditions and thread this issue with understanding. My professional experience was helpful because of the topic of elections, the conditions of their organization, freedoms and rights as a part of work of political subgroup and the means agreement. Uh, women's participation in negotiation fully reflects the state of women political participation. Therefore, uh, one phen uh, phenomenon is in, um, in separate from other. Sorry, uh, we have to remember that uh, we are talking about fully participation of women in political processes and uh, diplom diplomatic negotiation somehow is a part of that. There must be a woman, um, must be no woman get, get to for the negotiation process. When there is a level of formal negotiation, there are separate meetings or debates designed to um, women's participation. If there is no influence on the process or decision-making process, it's just manipulation. I'm not talking about current situation in Ukraine. I believe that in future track, we will have participation from all sides, women, men, and all of them uh, from Ukrainian side will work on Ukrainian interest. Ukrainian children have been killed by Russians every day for over months now, uh, months now. 60% of children in the 40 million country had to leave their homes after February 24. This is only the beginning of the horrible chapter of uh, European history. After the liberation, small towns, Irpin, Brodian, Kabucha, it's impossible to ignore what's going on there. Hundreds of people were executed, shot in the back of the head. Uh, with their hands tied behind their backs, they were murdered with their children. They have been lying in the streets for weeks. This is anti-human behavior. Along the roads of sidewalks lay the naked bodies of women who were raped. And I have to highlight that it's not only about gender problem for now. Unfortunately, we have so many cases when Russian soldiers raped uh, grandmothers, I know about case with 78 eight years old women, uh, with newborn children, with boys, and so on and so forth. It's truly horrible number of cases, but uh, as my previous colleagues and speakers said, not, not all of them are ready to talk, not just publicly, but to talk with authorities, with law enforcement bodies, with prosecutors, with lawyers, because they need physical support for now, mental support, and of course, medical support. In Bucha town, civilians were executed, unfortunately, as in other, um, other uh, small cities uh, in suburb area near the Kiev. Ukrainian society needs humanitarian aid, defense system, and psychological support. We have to develop together the huge, uh, program, not just for uh, one by one support for each of the victims, but to think about future psychological support for whole society, because it's about trauma and it's about victims, uh, which now is a huge number because of the uh, um, 
because of the um, this drama is so full full scale. Citizens of Ukraine are being tortured in 21st century simply because Russians seek revenge over Ukrainians for the fact that they exist with their own district identity, culture, and the aspiration to establish a democratic regime in the modern world. Uh, today, my country is in flame of war. This unprovoked intervention by Russian Federation is caused only by the fact that Russian leaders and absolute majority of the Russian people doesn't accept the collapse of Soviet Union. Violence against other nations, groundless uh, deprivation of their right to identity, physical extermination of the will to political participation, murder, and destruction of the people elite have not disappeared from the basic set of tools of Russian state. All we can say today is that liberal democracies do not enter a fight against each other, but they are forced to react to defend their rights and values. Ukraine and its people make up to frontier in the struggle today. Democratic states are based on the uh, philosophy that all citizens take part in a system of governance. A democratic polit uh, politician is accountable to how society reacts and must consider also the interests uh, of each minority or marginalized groups. Authoritarian regimes excluded society and citizens from the system of governance. They destroyed uh, you from being so, uh, socially active and politically active because it becomes risky for you, your business or your family. Elections become a uh, real tools uh, against manipulation if you are living in democratic uh, state. Totalitarianism and totalitarian regime, which is growing on in Russia today with their symbols, their uh, history, myths, and so on, is very dangerous because the totalitarian regime in Russia already involved people to be a part of this crucial number of crimes in Ukraine. That's why the participants on these tortures, murders, and many, many other cases will so continue to support Putin and Russia anyway. And at the final stage, I want to highlight that negotiation and peacekeeping and peace building process is possible when the battle on the field will finish, but women, have to be ready to support this process, build cap capacity to be a part of it, and to rebuild their professional skills from the peaceful time to post-war time. And we have to, to focus on post-war political recovery, because Ukraine has to be one of the leaders on the new country's neighbor, um, neighbor region to become democratic state as it was before before this war. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. And thank you for explaining uh, why inclusive processes are important uh, and what is critical now and what will be extremely critical when, pray God, this whole war ends. Um, so hold tight, Olhad. We'll come back to you during the, the Q&A. We're going to go now to Excuse me, uh, Katarina Sherapaka, who is the president of La Strada Ukraine, a human rights based organization dedicated to supporting victims of human trafficking, domestic violence, and sexual and other gender based violence. She is leading La Strada's significant efforts uh, to respond to the current crises, including human trafficking. Thank you so much, Katarina. I am very aware of the work that La Strada has been doing over many, many years. Uh, there have been widespread reports, and you've heard some references to them today from the previous speakers of sexual violence, trafficking, and forced deportations um, <clears throat> to Russian-held uh, areas. What is La Strada seeing on the ground? What can you confirm about the reports? Uh, that we're hearing and what kind of support is most effective at a time like now. Uh, so welcome Katarina, we're eager to hear from you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be able to address to such a wider audience. Um, 
Yes, since the February 24, since the beginning of the full scale invasion of Ukraine uh, by Russia, the whole territory of Ukraine is under attack. Every child, every adult, every woman, every man, every boy and every girl. Um, it's really like a life threat to people of the country. Um, it's destroying of the infrastructure, it's destroying of the ecology, it's destroying of the nature, it's destroying of the econ economy and it's destroying of the life. And as it often happens, unfortunately, during the wartime, women and children are the most vulnerable ones and really like a suffering uh, the most. Um, and yes, that's true that since February 24, the facts of sexual violence and rape specifically um, committed by the Russian occupants are reported and revealed uh, really widely. Um, it is necessary to mention, uh, and I would like to underline it, that it's not the very new or something new um, uh, that is used as an instrument of war uh, and used by the Russian occupants. Actually, the war has started more than eight years ago. And back to 2014, 2015, uh, these cases, these facts as uh, sexual violence committed by the occupants, that's they were existed already. But of course, now with a full scale invasion, uh, it became extremely widespread and the numbers are really great. Um, the first information about the sexual violence and, uh, and, and rape uh, came to our organization during the first weeks uh, of the war. Uh, it came via the online um, uh, messenger uh, that we provide consultations via the hotline. It came from Khersonska Oblast, the territory that it was mo at that moment was occupied and unfortunately still is occupied by Russians. And it was the sexual violence committed against uh, a woman and her underage daughter. Um, unfortunately, uh, under the given circumstances, it was difficult to provide uh, real assistance to them because the territory was occupied. Uh, and apart from psychological support, from uh, informational support, from explaining how it's possible, you know, to how it's possible to act in this situation, that was all the limit uh, that we were able to provide. Uh, by this moment, by today, we have already 16 uh, persons who applied, uh, who contacted our organization and who were sexually uh, uh, abused, uh, sexually uh, abused and raped uh, by Russian soldiers. 15 of them are women, one young man, and out of uh, uh, these numbers, uh, three is underage girls. There are also a lot of cases uh, in other uh, organizations. There are cases that are processed by the General Prosecutor Office. There are cases that are, are reported to the Ombudsman Office. There are cases of sexual violence uh, and specifically survivors that are assisted by our partner organizations, women's rights organizations, sisters from different regions of Ukraine. And um, unfortunately, even if we even combine all these figures, it would not give us the whole picture, the uh, exact picture of what is going on. Um, unfortunately, it's still like a tip of the iceberg of the situation. There are a lot of cases that would hardly be reported or probably never be reported because the uh, victims were killed. And it's uh, at this moment, I mean, the processes of investigation uh, are, are going on. And unfortunately, there are a lot of uh, women that would not be ready for a long time or some probably sometimes even never uh, to tell anyone about what had happened to them. The very important, uh, um, you know, conditions for uh, being able to step in and to raise the voice, it's uh, security. And unfortunately, at this moment, there is no security on the whole territory of Ukraine uh, for, for them. And uh, the necessity to support, necessities of psychological support, necessity in medical uh, assistance, these all the important conditions that are required that are vital uh, for, uh, for the survivors to be able to start to talk, to report to the officials, to the authorities and uh, process uh, with these uh, situations. Uh, the risk of human trafficking and exploitation also extremely increases during the war. As you all probably know that the majority of uh, refugees, the people who are fleeing Ukraine are women, women and children. And it's actually like uh, more than 90%. And uh, very often living without, uh, you know, documents, without clothes, without personal belonging, without money, often with their home destroys completely and no place, you know, to return. 
um, traumatized psychologically, physically, uh, being in an unstable condition, not being able to prepare or to organize their trip, the travel, to check, to verify the information, to check the contacts, they're extremely vulnerable. They're extremely vulnerable to further uh, trafficking. They're extremely vulnerable to further exploitation. After benefiting from the um, assistance that um, proposed and organized for them during the process of crossing the border. And we are extremely, as a civil society and as Ukrainians, we extremely appreciate to all those support provided by Ukrainian refugees, uh, by neighboring countries, by receiving countries, especially at the border, the volunteers, the, you know, the, the, the just citizens who are really willing to assist. But um, after benefiting from all this assistance, that is still like a temporary, uh, te temporary solution. Uh, and later on, with the trying to find, uh, with an attempt to find more stable or more, uh, you know, like a prolonged accommodation or more prolonged, you know, better um, job or income. Uh, we're, we're, when try, uh, trying to go further within the country or sometimes propose to be uh, brought to other countries, they would be extremely uh, vulnerable to any types of violence. It can be sexual uh, uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation, it can be labor exploitation, it can be involving in criminal activity, it can be involvement of uh, in begging in, you know, and all other options. And of course, they would be really like, a, unfortunately, like an easy target uh, for the traffickers, uh, for those who, again, um, also will try to benefit from the existing crisis and from uh, definitely try to use it for exploitation and forgetting their uh, profits. Uh, there is also another issue, very important issue is like, uh, is the forced deportation uh, of Ukrainian citizens, uh, adults and children to non-controlled territories or to Russia. And speaking about this, uh, uh, this problem, we also understand that these uh, women and children uh, in particular are also extremely vulnerable for violence, extremely vulnerable for further uh, exploitation, uh, for trafficking also, and for use in, um, in various aspects. We receive calls to our hotline when uh, women are uh, uh, deported forcibly uh, by the threat of the rape and killing uh, men for uh, for the um, threat of killing and they take children out of their families out of the mother so this is something that is really like a needed to be uh, you know, stopped and really uh, needed uh, attention and interfere uh, of inclusion of the all possible instruments, including international institutions. There are a lot of cases of uh, abduction, torture, and killing of women activists, women volunteers, journalists, and representatives of the local administration and communities, like as directors of the school, uh, heads of the villages, and. Um, Again, this is uh, for those strong women who take uh, active position in their life and who, who stand with Ukraine, who uh, fulfill their obligation and who are very active and therefore they're also under the front line and under attack of the Russians. And uh, yes, as I would also I would like to uh, to you know to to echo to what colleagues previously speakers said that. Uh, the war also showed the extremely important of the role of women in all the aspects uh, in the fight, in the protection of the country, um, in military, in medical, in providing uh, you know, lessons, uh, in uh, being volunteers. That's very important. It's, it's, and it is very important you know, to always to remember that the role and the uh, in impact uh, and um, uh, contribution of women. As for what is uh, what kind of the um, assistance, what could be done uh, uh, here? I think one of the very important uh, point is that um, it should be really, I mean, the war and this uh, situation should be addressed seriously. And it should be clear that it's not only about Ukraine, but it's about the whole world, the human 
human rights and the democracy principles in general. Uh, we do need the continuation of the support to refugees. Uh, we need to ensure monitoring of the situation, monitoring and responding to the appearing trafficking tendencies, because this is, uh, to be uh, realistic, this is a long-term process and long-term impact uh, that would follow. It's also uh, creating the possibilities of the access to the labor market for Ukrainian refugees, for women, because they're, apart from being refugees, they're also the professionals, they're also the specialists, and they can, can contribute uh, to the economy uh, of other countries and support uh, themselves. It's also uh, very important uh, to uh, pay attention uh, to use all possible, <laughs> in these situations also impossible instruments to prevent the deportation and abduction of Ukrainians from their uh, temporary occupied territories and to monitor the situation with their rights and assist in returning them to Ukraine. Um, I have to say that, uh, that this war, unfortunately, uh, will have the um, long-term impact and it will require the long-term strategies and solutions uh, to, be, uh, to be able to address the all negative consequences. Uh, it will definitely require the strengthening capacities, both from the institutional and individual levels. Uh, capacity of the specialist, uh, equipment, creating the, the specific services for those who uh, suffered from this, uh, from the war, uh, in particular from sexual uh, violence during the war, providing assistance. Uh, that's also uh, strengthening capacity and ability uh, to conduct the investigation and ensuring access to justice uh, to suffer it. And of course, for restoring the peace. This is all needed, but right here and now, we need uh, the support um, to stop this war and we need the support from, uh, from the weapon, we need the humanitarian support because um, otherwise uh, all those um, programs, impacts, um, they would uh, be uh, like an, in a long-term perspective, but we need to stay alive now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katarina, both for laying out the tremendous vulnerabilities uh, that confront women right now, but also the important agency that they have and are uh, exemplifying and how this fits both the situation in Ukraine and beyond. Uh, we're gonna try to connect with Maria Berlinska. I can see that she is traveling. Um, she has been in and out of this program. Um, so let me just introduce Maria. She is a Ukrainian military volunteer, a women's rights advocate, and the founder of the Women's Veteran Movement of Ukraine. She served on the front lines of the Revolution of Dignity and subsequently volunteered for the war in the Donbass. She has been a very strong champion of women's rights and integration into the Ukrainian armed forces including the Invisible Battalion, a series of reports uh, that she was instrumental uh, in documenting women's participation in the war against the Russian-backed separatists in the Donbass. And she has been credited uh, with bringing about changes in the law that gradually led to women's equality in the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Maria, thank you for being with us. Uh, I know it's not difficult, easy when you're traveling, um, but let me just ask you uh, very quickly, so we don't lose you, um, about the changes that have happened in the security sector since you and others first volunteered in the Donbass region some eight years ago. Um, what changes have come? What is, what is women's engagement like in the armed forces today? And what are the veterans organizations doing? Thank you for, first of all, thank you for invitation. Uh, thank you for uh, my pleasure and honor be, to be here. And um, yeah, I'm traveling from Kiev to Lviv. Uh, we have, uh, as, as you know, today, uh, May 9, and uh, Russia celebrating um, Victory Day, and uh, that's why they they uh, they try to shell in us by artillery. This day more um, more dangerous than other days for us. Um, we have uh, a lot of cases um, today in Ukraine. 
uh, artillery sh shelling. But um, uh, returning to your question, uh, I would like to share more about um, women, uh, women's role in uh, this uh, war. And uh, you may know that we have uh, one of the highest percentage uh, women in the sector of security and defense in the army. Uh, as of now, it's uh, more than 25%. And a lot of uh, women became volunteers and uh, they are helping uh, Ukrainian army and uh, uh, civilians as well with evacuating, with medicine, uh, with uh, humanitarian purposes and so on. Um, I would like to emphasize here that um, I would like to cite uh, my colleague Natalia Bugayova. Uh, uh, and uh, she wrote that Bucha uh, is uh, an observable microcosm of a deliberate Russian terror campaign against Ukrainians. And uh, women, and especially women and children, uh, uh, they, uh, they face these atrocities more than other, um, other uh, representatives of society. So um, we have Russians especially um, practice their, their atrocities toward and against uh, women and against uh, vulnerable groups. And uh, first of all, they would like to uh, they would like to um, kill and um, torture uh, women veterans because uh, and women uh, volunteers because of our experience because of our because uh, we uh, spent almost eight past eight years to protect our country. So uh, I would like to uh, to add here the, the last point. Last but not least, um, that um, uh, the only way to liberate Ukraine and to help uh, vulnerable groups, the only way is to launch a lot of um, humanitarian projects uh, and uh, as well help with weapon. Ukraine can win the next phase of this war with timely and proper Western support. Uh, unfortunately, this support that uh, was announced uh, last week with, I mean, land lease and other uh, support from other countries, unfortunately, it's not enough. And unfortunately, we haven't timely support as of now. Ukraine has won the first phase of this war uh, and has a chance to win the second one. Um, with proper and timely military aid, Ukraine has a chance to win the second phase by pushing back Russia's offensive and continuing uh, its efforts to liberate Russia, Russia held areas. Uh, the Ukrainian government uh, has made clear what military aid it needs from Western leaders. And uh, so I, I see here, um, uh, I see here our ambassador, uh, Her Excellency uh, Madame Makarova. So uh, I would like to emphasize here that I would like to emphasize here that uh, Ukrainian government, uh, uh, Ukrainian government did a lot of. Mm, call of actions to um, Western governments and Western leaders. Um, for example, my friends, uh, as, as of now, they on uh, uh, they um, they at Azov um, uh, factory, Azov Azov uh, style plant, and uh, I would like to use this opportunity to ask all uh, all of all of our audience. Please um, do 
as much uh, uh, informational sharing as, as possible because they need help. And uh, mm, a lot of wounded there, a lot of people who, uh, who killed there, but uh, s still uh, uh, a few hundreds of... Um, our uh, a few hundreds of our friends uh, uh, including women veterans uh, they they are uh, at the at the Mariupol region as a as a steel plant so uh, let's use all uh, possible and impossible opportunities to liberate them and uh, to um, for, uh, to um, to to make the, to make uh, them them free uh, from from this uh, uh, Russian occupation and Russian attack. Um, for example, uh, you may know that um, uh, in um, international uh, practice uh, we have um, special. Uh, special uh, regime, special, uh, mm, let me find this, uh, let me find this uh, world. Uh, and, um, but I know that it's a, a, as, as, as far as I know, extension a regime when, um, just let me ask my friend, he's a lawyer. Maria, extraction, it's called extraction. Extraction, exactly, extraction. So um, uh, it's the only way because we 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 haven't uh, opportunity we haven't uh, uh, we haven't power to uh, liberate them by uh, by military actions. But the only way is it's a, a military and uh, di diplomatical and uh, political way. Let's use this extraction practice to 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 liberate our friends. I I have a. Uh, Personally, I have two friends there. Uh, it's my old friends uh, from the university. And uh, uh, time is critical. The, I believe that the West uh, and all civilized world must deliver the aid uh, Ukraine needs to defeat the next wave uh, of the Russian offensive before uh, the offensive uh, b before that offensive uh, begins, um, because half measures or, or, or delay in military and uh, uh, half measures or or or, or delays uh, in military aid will uh, will prolong the war uh, and prolong atrocities uh, toward um, uh, activists, toward women veterans, toward toward children. Uh, and uh, delay will, will increase Putin's uh, chances uh, of winning and lead to more death and, and destruction in the world. So um, my last point here is uh, let's stop war while it's in Ukraine. Because we know here that um, the third uh, world war already started and uh, if uh, theoretically Putin will um, will take all these resources, we have uh, five nuclear plants, a lot of cities, and of, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of natural resources and human resources. So, if Putin theoretically will take all of this, it will be uh, only. Um, uh, on the resource to and plus down to uh, to make next uh, next uh, step and to, to take a, uh, to take a, an, another country so i i don't believe in a nato um uh, in, Na in nato protection i believe or in our solidarity i believe in women's solidarity and i believe uh, in uh, human rights for all of us and uh, for uh, for our values I believe in in uh, in our values, and our values is uh, truth and free world for all of us, open world. So um, let's not just 
let, let, let's do not only discussions, but uh, let, let's do acts and uh, let's support people uh, while uh, they alive and uh, let's stop war while it's in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria, and thank you for coming to us uh, as you're traveling. Uh, really appreciate your messages. Uh, we're going to turn now to the Q&As from the audience. We have very limited time left, but we'll try to get in what we can. And thank you again, Maria. Allie? Thank you. Thank you, Maria. With the limited time, I just want to note that we have many questions coming in from the European Union, from the OSCE, and from the United States policy makers asking for your top recommendations for them and the institutions they represent specifically. So I'll turn that over to you all. Um, again, that's the European Union, OSCE, and the United States. So we'll, we'll start with whoever wants to start with. Um... Yefenia, do you want to start with top start. recommendations uh, to the OSCE, uh, to the EU, yes. to, will... to the United States? Uh, yes, I will be really, yes. Um, well, uh, mainly to, to, uh, to United States as Web and Financial financial aid, three main messages to help Ukraine. And to OCE, uh, I'm, I'm also, by the way, the member of Parliamentary Assembly OCE, uh, not on the pace. And um, um, I know that uh, we can talk a lot about uh, security, about cooperation, but we really need to do something with organization if the aggressor can put a veto on a mission. On, on a mission. We need to think about how to, how to uh, you know, exclude Russia from the membership or to find other way. So OC could do the job, uh, not, um, you know, uh, by being stopped by the country, which is an aggressor. Thank you. Anybody else, Olha? Uh, first of all, I want to add that um, we need a huge ally to have uh, independent um war international sorry international tribunal against aggressor because you know it's a long-term perspective process that's why we have joined the best academician brains and advocate who are going to support the process when the international society and countries will join in and sign the international agreement to join the process of tribunal uh, from another stage, we have a problem with local jurisdiction because of capacity law enforcement bodies and prosecutors, because of lack, lack of equipment for documentization of war crime on the ground. And I believe that our U.S. partners uh, may help us and EU partners will help us on this issue. I know that ICC is very well known and developed institution. At the same time, we have so huge number of cases on the ground that ICC can cover in the future hold the cases. That's why we have to support the local justice system and development a special court for the uh, organize, organizing the hearings because of amount of the cases which we see on the ground and which we are covering as monitoring human rights organization, journalists and so on and so forth as civil society. I believe that there is a political will in general prosecutor office to support this process and this huge number of open cases showed us that this is real political will, but we have to think in perspective of five, 10, 20 years, because irreversibility of punishment is the best tool to stop future authoritarian regimes uh, in their fight against democratic countries. And we have to develop this justice system on the international and local level to build capacity on law enforcement bodies on the local level and don't duplicate this activity uh, for different justice system and for women. Uh, first of all, I'm going to say that women are capable in Ukraine to support all the processes, but it's about not about the future, it's about current preparation to be a stakeholders in the process. As I mentioned, the best gender quota 
uh, and a challenge for the same time is a war period, martial law period. And for now, we have to think how recover the country after the martial law to democratic state and this type of managing of territories. And I hope that all the partners think are thinking not only about um, recovery funds for Ukraine, but think how to support uh, local sub-government bodies, which became a strong leader in a process to uh, serving the people, to saving the people, and to help people on the ground because of the war for now. And I believe that we will have success because Ukraine is those countries which have to be successful in the future. And this is a solving the this is a type of the solving the problem against Russia. Please don't focus on Russian uh, oppositions for now or Russian human rights organizations. Sorry, but they had more than 20 years to defend their democracy. And we did it each of the uh, decade in Ukrainian reality. And we have to do it each of the time. Uh, this is not competition between Ukrainian and Russian civil society, but unfortunately, Putin's system just broke society there. And we have on the first stage to defend Ukraine, to give uh, the chance for this country to be developed, and then to continue to develop Russian democracy. Don't switch a target. It's very important for now. Thank you. Thank you, Olha. Uh, Katerina, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, maybe just to uh, to to echo and to support that co colleagues already said that uh, yes, I think it's very important to to think of and to I don't know revise the the mechanism and the instrument that would not allow uh, Russia to block the decisions uh, to block the instrument that are uh, entitled to um, to protect uh, Ukraine to protect that democracy, and uh, that would be really like a useful. Uh, instrument and tool um, to um, to address the, the current situation. And yes, and I would also like to support what just Olga said, that let's uh, not uh, focus on um, uh, human rights organization or activists from Russia, because I mean, they, that's that's true. I mean, there was enough time and enough opportunities for them uh, to uh, to speak, uh, to protect and to be active and here not to change the focus of uh, the situation and the war and the aggression against Ukraine. Thank you. And and Maria, do you want to come in with the last word? Yeah. I would like to add some, maybe, I don't know, some unpleasant things here that, uh, first of all, uh, we have a lot of atrocities here and uh, such horrible situation, not only because of Putin, but because after 2014, some European countries, uh, some European countries uh, sell a lot of weapons to Russia. And we know that some people in Bucha and Irpin uh, were killed by uh, that weapon. For example, French weapon or German weapon or Italian weapon. So uh, unpunished crime will be repeated. And uh, Putin, she, uh, he, he, he was unpunished uh, uh, for Crimea and for other, um, for Donbass uh, uh, war. And uh, he, he started war not in, uh, not on uh, February 24, but uh, eight years ago in 2014. So I believe that um, we have the situation not because, or only because of uh, Russian propaganda and uh, uh, Russian society, but because um, our our world world order, our system uh, of uh, uh, of law, inter I mean international law, uh, doesn't doesn't work. Uh, that's why this situation in Ukraine, it's a good test for all world. Uh, 
how how we how we will manage this evil? How we will manage this new dictatorship? This uh, uh, new new uh, new Hitler? Yeah, in in, in the world. And uh, I believe that we 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 will manage the situation all together. But let's uh, manage the situation timely. It's very important because all every day uh, costs thousands and thousands lives, uh, innocent lives. Not only our military boys and girls, but uh, a lot of civilians, a lot of children. Even uh, they even not not only kill children, but they rape children. Uh, so, so, if if we will have again, if we will have weapon, timely and uh, technological weapon, in in uh, um, if we will have enough weapon, we we are ready to liberate uh, Mariupol and uh, other other cities. And I would like here uh, to point uh, to point out that uh, the same situation while we we are speaking here, the same situation as it was in Bucha, in other towns and cities uh, that occupied by Russia as as of now, Kharkiv region, Donetsk region, Zaporizhia region, Kherson. A lot of we we have a lot of evidence about atrocities there, especially especially against women, especially against vulnerable groups, especially against LGBT people, especially against uh, activists, uh, uh, people with disabilities, all people who have just, uh, who share democratic principles, who share human, human values, all of them are under attack. So uh, we are ready to protect ourselves and we are ready to protect all free world. Just give us enough weapon and just give us this weapon timely. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you, Katarina. Uh, thank you, Olha and Yevhenia, to Ambassador Markarova and to uh, Secretary General Schmidt uh, for illuminating uh, these issues for us today. Uh, for demonstrating why responding uh, to the uh, needs of Ukraine in this moment of great urgency uh, is critically important for all of us and to support uh, the women NGOs on the ground who are doing Herculean work. Uh, so thank you to each and every one of you uh, for all that uh, you are doing and we will all stay in touch with you. Thank you all. <laughs>